الله الرحمن الرحيم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Friends of the Dar, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Tonight, Dar al-Athar al-Islamiyya is pleased to welcome to its annual cultural season a new and not so new participant, presenting her second lecture uh, at Dar al-Athar al-Islamiyya tonight. She is not new to Kuwait. A Fulbright scholar, she also has um, she has also been a visiting professor here at the American University of Kuwait. Dr. Suad comes to us from Arizona State University, where she is the founding chair of the university's Council of Arabic and Islamic Studies. She is involved in a wide variety of studies, including the popular interdisciplinary field of women gender studies. This evening, her topic will be quite an interesting one. In a lecture entitled, A Focus on the Peaceful Message of the Quran, Engendering Peace Through Peaceful Feminine Roles, Female Roles. She will be highlighting women's roles in peaceful ends through an enlightened understanding of Islam. Dr. Su Dr. Saad was uh, has written extensively on the topic and within this field, as well as delivering a number of lectures related to it. However, as a woman myself, please first allow me to take the role of peacekeeper here tonight in our lecture by encourages all to switch off our mobile phones, not to disturb. Thank you, and now please join me in welcoming Dr. Suad Taj Ali. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah. Thank you very much indeed for calling. I'd like to extend my thanks and appreciation to Dar al Athar al Islamiyya and to Her Excellency Sheikh Hassa Sabah Al Salim Al Sabah for extending this kind invitation for me for the second time to give a lecture today. I gave a lecture in 2012 on a focus on the egalitarian message of the Quran. And today I will speak about the, a focus on the peaceful message of the Quran, engendering peace through female roles. As a background to understanding the concept of peace in Islam, it is important to mention that linguistically, the root of the Arabic word Islam is silm, which denotes the English meaning of peace. The word Islam also means submission to the will of God and peace to all humanity. Several verses in the Quran discuss and promote peace, including let, be, let, the, let, be, let there be no compulsion in religion, la ikraha fi deen. In addition, in the context of dealing with the enemy in a war or conflict situation, the Quran states, And if they, the enemy, incline towards peace, do thou also incline towards peace. And trust in Allah, for he is the one who hears and knows best. Similarly, in the concept of peace, runs in the prophetic tradition, which is the second source of Islamic law after the Quran. For example, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is quoted to have advised his followers to salute people of all faith with peace before beginning any discussion, as he stated, as salam qabla al kalam, peace before speech. This study explores the role of women uh, that they can play using their knowledge of peace in Islam to help members of their communities negotiate and practice peaceful coexistence. The study further attempts to address questions such as whether the seeds of peaceful social coexistence can be sown and knitted in the fabric of society if women are able to educationally instill a culture of peace when raising new generations, what new approaches and methods are required to understand and evaluate women's agency in peace building, politically, socially, and in, in everyday life. 
Theoretically, Muslim women and feminist scholars in general approach the concept of peace in Islam from the perspective of its original sources, the Quran and the Hadith. Cornell professor Ni'mat Hafiz Barazanji, a Syrian American, she approaches uh, and her approach to education and, and uh, empowerment uh, can be seen as a step further to evaluate the education of religion as a tool for peace. She uses Quranic pedagogical dynamics as the philosophical basis for Muslim women to develop an integrative curriculum that proposes a shift in learning, knowing, teaching, and application of Islamic worldview. The study will use two African examples from the Sudanic belt to discuss the role of Muslim women in engendering peace. The two examples will focus on the East African country, Sudan, and the West African country, Nigeria. This important study can open greater avenues for women from around the world to direct their education towards emphasizing a culture of peace and to share their experiences on how to move from conflict and war to reconciliation and peace, and how to further instill concepts, beliefs, and themes of social justice and solidarity, and to simultaneously acknowledge and value these peaceful means while reducing the negative impact of harmful, hostile, cultural, and traditional practices on society. Theoretically, Muslim women and Islamist scholars in general, as I mentioned earlier, uh, approach this you know, uh, uh, issue of Islam from its original sources. I'm going to talk about comparatively different, you know, co concept of peace uh, that uh, advocate while simultaneously balancing the tension between pluralism and secularism, and comparatively advocates um, of religious education for women can be found in other parts of the world as reflected in the emergence of the International Institute of, uh, of Islamic Education uh, for Women by uh, Al Huda in Pakistan, founder and director Dr. Uh, Farahat Hashimi established Al Huda as a small academy for women in Islamabad in 1994, and it eventually uh, branched into an organized uh, movement into the other Pakistani cities and abroad. According to uh, Faiza Mushtaq, the primary activity offered by Al Huda is education in religious subjects intended to supplement rather than replace secular academic education. Barazanji's Women's Identity and the Quran, a new woman uh, reading that came from uh, Pre University Press of Florida in 2004, uh, ex explored that further. So this study primarily draws on two African examples to address the theological and social principles of peace in Islam, and in doing so, explores the role of women can play using their knowledge of peace in Islam to help members of their communities negotiate and practice peaceful coexistence. The analysis suggests that the seeds of peaceful social coexistence can be sown and knitted in the fabric of the society, as I mentioned earlier. Now, I will just give a brief description of uh, the role of Sudanese, of Sudanese women and then a Nigerian woman, and then before I go into details. Two African examples from the Sudanic belt of uh, East African Sudan and West African Nigeria highlight the role of Muslim women in engendering peace in the, in the region. The position of Sudanese women Religious scholars and preachers are a part of an old tradition Islamic history in which women played a unique role in the transmission and dissemination of Islamic knowledge. The Quran makes no distinction between men and women in this regard in its actual and pro uh, correct reading. And the Prophet Muhammad in a famous hadith advised his companions to learn half of your religion from that woman. In reference to his wife Aisha, who transmitted some 2,210 hadith narratives to the foremost early Muslim traditionists. Sudanese written sources such as Kitab al-Tabaqat by Muhammad Noor with Difallah briefly discussed some women preachers or educators as prominent figures and cited Fatima bin Jabir as one of the earliest women educators in Sudan. Drawing on the wealth of this historical background today, many categories of uh, female educators can be cited in the Sudan. The first part of this chapter discusses four categories and uh, what role these women play within these brackets. The other example is uh, Nana Asma'u from Nigeria. Another interesting example is the unique experience of Nana Asma'u, a 19th century Nigerian Muslim scholar and peace advocate who used her faith 
as basis for the pursuit of her knowledge and who was dedicated to promoting peace among conflicting groups in harmony in her community. Raised in the Qadriya Sufi order, Nana Asma'u was devoted to promoting reconciliation, education, and justice through peaceful means based on her knowledge of the Quran and the Prophet Sunnah tradition. In the midst of warfare in the West African part of the Sunanic Belt, currently Nigeria, Asma'u teaching greatly and positively helped change the culture in which she lived. She was an eyewitness to battle about which um, she reported and helped change the culture in which she, uh, in her written works during the period of Sokoto Jihad. This is a reference to a series of battles in campaign reform Islam between 1804 and there, thereafter. Asma'u's personal and peaceful jihad was a um, jihad of knowledge that focused uh, on the education of women as primary mentors of men. Now we, 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 we see the word jihad today very distorted, not only by you know, Western media, but by Muslim, radical Muslims and extremists themselves, using it as offense, as launching wars against the so-called non-Muslims and, and so on. Whereas the primary word of jihad in Arabic stems from the, uh, the uh, Arabic root jihada, which is to struggle peacefully and self-struggle you know, um, primarily. Asma'u thus assumed the role of, uh, of an active teacher of both men and women and did not confine herself to teaching students in her immediate community. Instead, she reached out through other teachers to engage women in isolated rural areas, as is further explained below. The role played, so I'm going in much details about the Sudan and then come back to Nigeria. The role played by Sudanese women in the field of Islamic education has been documented by several scholars and writers, figures such as Sheikha Khadija Al-Azhari, Zainab Muhammad Ahmed, Fatma bin Jabir, and Khadija Omar Kashoi are among early Sudanese women educators that this chapter references. While reflecting on the experiences of these early women, the chapter will simultaneously focus on and discuss more closely the current situation where as previously mentioned, at least four categories of female preachers and Quran teachers can be found in the Sudan. Independent, Islamist, Ansar Sunnah, and Republican sisters. Although the latter groups are relatively new to Sudanese society, independent women preachers have deeper roots in Sudanese life. I will talk only about the first group and then just give a, a brief description of the, of, the, of the other three. Historically, since the 15th century, Sudanese women were active participants in Khalawi. The word Khalwa is a, a Sudanese Arabic word for uh, religious seminaries, singular Khalwa, as teachers of the Quran and Islamic education. Women's Khalawi specialized in female education in order to eliminate their religious illiteracy and to teach them elementary religious sciences. Women used to memorize the Quran, the Quran and learn Tartil, the art of recitation and Tajweed, perfection of recitation, in addition to some of the Sharia principles. By the 18th century, many women preachers were as famous as their male counterparts. Among those preachers were Sheikha bint uh, Ata, Sheikha Ruqayya bint Abd al-Qadir, and Sheikha Khadija al-Azhari. Khadija was the sister of Ahmed al-Azhari, one of the highest ranking uh, fuqaha jurists in the Sudan during the Turkey uh, in 1820 to 85. Khadija and Ahmed were the son and daughter of Sheikh Ismail al-Wali, the founder of the Ismaili Sufi path in Kordofan, in Western Sudan. Khadija directed her seminary and provided religious instruction for women in their homes. Other women teachers included Sheikh bint al-Abdul Rahim from the city of al um, in Western Sudan, who worked with many other women from the household of the al-Mahdi family and his successors. Besides directing her khalwa, Sheikh bint Abd al Rahim used to visit women in their homes uh, to educate them. However, despite the efforts of women like Khadija, Sheikh um, and, and, she and Sheikh edu education efforts, the situation for women was not significantly affected during the Mahdiya between 1885 and 98 period. Uh, and the assumption was um, that women's, uh, women followers were followers of men. Hajjah Kachif Badri, 
uh, in her book, Harakat, Al Harakat Al Nisa'iya Fi Sudan, The Women's Movement in Sudan, is a very good source detailing those. So accordingly, a system was enforced that deprived women of their independence and dictated that they should be protected by men. Nonetheless, women continued their personal efforts to maintain their Islamic education endeavors. One of the positive outcomes of women's personal efforts was reflected in the fact that such educational activism helped to establish the basis of women's educational work, as many of the pioneering women received their education from those Halawi, Halawi sources. The first inspector of girls' education in Sudan was Mrs. Medina Abdullah, received her elementary education, or part of it, at the hands of Sheikh Khadija bint Wad Abi Safiya. And the first Sudanese physician ever, Dr. Khaled Zahir, received her elementary education as well, or part of it, at the Khalwa of uh, Fakih Hassan in the Morada neighborhood in Omdurman. In Eastern Sudan, and by the standards of that early time, a plethora of women's Khalawi flourished, given that many religious families were concerned and made sure that women learned the basics of their religion. Hence, they paid utmost attention to women's Khalawi and opened several in, of them after 19, in the 1890s. Uh, a move which accorded the woman a high status. This was the basis of a tradition that continued throughout subsequent decades in Eastern Sudan. In 1945, a group of women, including Zainab Muhammad Ahmed, Khadija Omar Kashoi, and Haniya Ibrahim, established women's Khalawi that are still in operation in such cities as Tokar, Port Sudan, and Sawakin in Eastern Sudan. In 1950, a group of the Eastern Sudanese Hadendawa tribe led by Sheikh Ali Bitai was active in establishing women's Khalawi in the regional city of Roma. Unfortunately, the concept of the Khalwa itself as a form of national education in general faced not only negligence locally, but also fought by the colonial British administrators. Such antagonism and inattention attention were reflected in different forms as a way to discourage them, including the refusal to pay salaries or to support those who maintained Khalawi. Other forms involved the shutting down of some of the Khalawi based on weak, weak justifications, simultaneously um, activating Christian missionaries and establishing a sub-grade school system to totally eliminate the Khalawi. However, in 1938, with the establishment of the Sudanese Graduate Congress, Mu'tamar al-Khirijin, some of these Khalawi were re-established in a clear reaction to the British government and in an attempt to strengthen national work and the activities of the women's Khalawi. To contextualize Sudanese resistance against colonial attempts to eliminate the Khalawi and Sudanese efforts to claim a space of autonomy of the mind, it is interesting to look at arguments made by scholars in the field of uh, the subaltern studies. Post-colonial approaches regarding tensions between private and public spaces in colonial India examine how the private regarding uh, uh, space, a space of female power, have held uh, on to the traditions and religion as a form of autonomy. To better understand the structure of class uh, uh, relations in India, subaltern studies focus on the uh, un unidentified label of citizens. Post-colonial scholars such as Gatti Pandey and Partha Chatterjee have discussed the way in which gender and race have served as the basis for and have infused class differentiation. And so I'm going to skip this part to go back to uh, uh, the concept of peace in Islam. The educational tra tradition based on peaceful Islam continued throughout the centuries, and today a good number of female preachers are active uh, participants in daily preaching in Sudanese society. Uh, Layla Sayyid Khidr, um, who was born in 1938, and when I, when I did this uh, earlier study, she was still alive. She passed away in 2011. She uh, was an active independent educator in Khartoum who began preaching in mosques in the 1980s. Khidr holds a bachelor's degree in psychology from Cairo University, Egypt. She preaches in four major mosques in Khartoum. Um, she began her preaching discussing groups with only a few women in attendance. Over the years, an increasing number of women began attending her sermons, and she moved to bigger mosques to accommodate larger audiences. Uh, she related her decision to teach peace in Islam followed, um, 
followed at that time uh, followed a severe illness she suffered that confined her to bed for over a year. It was during that time that she began reading religious texts and, be, and became deeply inspired by them. She is critical of doom and gloom, rich preachers who tend to frighten women. Her intention is to make women more aware of their rights under Islam, to instruct them in their duties in a positive tone, to draw women's and others' attention to peaceful teachings of Islam. And um, now, this, um, I'm going to just go briefly on those second and third. The second, Aisha uh, al-Ghabshawi, and these are the, this second you know, group I'm very critical of because they belong to uh, the current ruling regime who in Sudan of Omar al-Bashir who came to power in June 30th of 1989, overthrowing a democratic you know, go elected government and it's an Islamist regime. Now, these women claim to be uh, working for women's causes, whereas they are very supportive of the regime and they have not done anything in regards to promoting women's issues. The third group is uh, Ansara Sunnah as well, and they're even more strict. In, you know, th this part is just a description of the complexity of the political situation in Sudan. That I, I don't want to go much in details, and you can have it when they publish uh, the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the lecture. The Ansara Sunnah, you know, who are very strict and um, as well, you know, uh, have not done anything in regards to promoting women's issues or even the peaceful aspect of Islam, of which they're both the, you know, the uh, Muslim sisters of Ay Dr. Aisha al Ghabshawi of the Islam, Durman University of Islamic Studies, and uh, Maryam, uh, who is the representative of Ansara Sunnah. They are very well versed in the concepts of peace in Islam but they have done nothing to promote that or preach it. The last group, the fourth one, is the female uh, developed as part of the Republican Brotherhood movement. Mahmoud Muhammad Taha established the Republican Brothers Party in 1945. However, women did not become active preachers until the 1970s when Al-Akhwat uh, Al-Jumhuriya, um, the Republican Sisters, uh, their group was formed and uh, women members participated fully in all these activities. Uh, uh, a short quote uh, from Dr. Abdullah Naim, who is a professor at uh, Emory University. Uh, through activities, through their roles as leaders of activist groups on university campuses, public parks, and even street corners, preaching and distributing party booklets. However, the execution of Taha in 1985 by the late military rule of Jafar Nimeri was a severe blow to the party and both its male and female activism. Now, all these three, you know, and, uh, apart from the first independent group, the three others, I criticize uh, the aspect of the fact that they are very manipulated by their, you know, the parties. And so they promote party agenda and party politics more than women's, you know, uh, issues. And, uh, uh, and uh, so um, I suggest different things in my study about how this could change. So um, an important question that this study investigates is how can the women discussed above and women like them move from theory to practice? In other words, how can they use their knowledge of the principle of peace in Islam and their education experiences to help their society move from conflict and war to reconciliation space? As previously noted, a significant point that is worth contemplating relates to my critique of Sudanese political parties, manipulation of some of their female members to serve um, the party agenda, which does not necessarily focus on women's issues. Further investigation should be sought of why these women continue to allow this manipulation. Having said that, it is very important to discuss all this in a separate project within the historical context of the political situation in the Sudan, given that the fact that the country has not only been afflicted by the longest civil war on the African continent, but also by subsequent dictatorial regimes that continue to hamper attempts for peace. Now I'd more like to move to Nigeria and um, some details about the role that Nana Asma'u has played, which is a very significant role in peace. She was born in 1793 and died in 1864. She was the daughter of Osman Danfodu, 
than for you who established the Sokoto rule following se several battles and tribal conflicts in what is currently known as Nigeria. The Sokoto was one of the most influential kingdoms in the northern part of the African Sudanese belt at the time. Asma'u was an example of a highly educated woman who was considered a leading scholar in the Islamic science of the Quran and Hadith. Most importantly, Asma'u used her knowledge of Islam's original sources to educate women of the conflicting tribes against violence and to foster a culture of peace following the Fulan Jihad in 1804 and uh, 1810. When Dan Fodiu defeated his enemies, another tool that Asma was skillfully used in her instruction of both men and women was her remarkable collection of poetry. As Beverly Mack and Jean Boyd have documented, Asma was quite influential and played a major role in the field of women's education when she organized a group of female instructors and teachers that traveled throughout the country to educate women, especially in peaceful Islam. These hajis, as they were called, the local name for such teachers, employed Asma'u's writings and books of verses in addition to other Sufi manuscripts to train women of all tribes, conquered and victorious, in a culture of peaceful coexistence. Based on this well-established educational tradition, Asma'u eventually became a model for African women in the fields of education, poetry, and peace building. As was the case with her family, Nana Asma'u was a Sunni Muslim that was uh, raised as a follower of the Qadriya Sufi order, founded by Abdul Qadir al-Jailani of Baghdad, in, who died in 1166. Records on her Fulani family indicate that they had been Muslim scholars for at least last in the generations. As traditionally known with the Sufis in general and with the Qadriya order in particular, materials, um, material life and uh, comfort were not part of their primary concerns. Asma'u views of the world were hence shaped by classical Islamic education that trans transcended the traditional education of memorizing the Quran. Her education included a religious program of study that was comprised of Islamic philosophical text on prayer, Sufism, legal issues, and fiqh that deals with the religious behavior and conduct in addition to tawhid or monotheism. Islam thus constituted the foundation of Asma'u's experience where she learned from her family's library of hundreds of handwritten manuscripts on Islamic studies as well as her own poetry. She eventually maintained her family's aim in teaching and transmitting moderate and peaceful Islam knowledge, Islamic knowledge, to subsequent generations. So further details, you know, I mentioned as well about Asma'u and given the fact that my presentation has about 37 slides and, and I know that's very long, I'm going to move to the second part to juxtapose this with current scholarship by Muslim American women in, you know, Islamic studies. So eventually Asma'u's role and place in a society torn apart, uh, apart by war for was the respected teacher who aimed to unify a community with diverse cultural backgrounds through a peaceful religious philosophy that emphasized and encouraged the obligation to practice generous social w w welfare and the education of every soul regardless of gender or social position. This is very important as it shows what Islam had to say about peace in its correct reading. Largely, Asma'u's teaching sent beacons of knowledge throughout society. The messages it carried promised the dissemination of education, mutual aid aimed at attaining a higher knowledge of peace in religion. And I draw a contrast here, and I argue that given this early awareness of Islamic knowledge in general and on peace in particular in Nigeria, it becomes quite ironic to see grave misinterpretation in northern Nigeria today amongst the Hausa ethnic group in the name of uh, Sharia and Islam, namely as distorted by such groups today as the so-called Boko Haram, their violence and abuse of women in the name of Islam. Much work is needed to defeat such distortions. And of course, I'm sure that you are all familiar of the Boko, Boko Haram um, group that, you know, they abuse young, you know, younger than teenage uh, girls forcing them into marriage to their leaders and this has been covered widely by by the media and it is very very sad indeed to see such a contrast while asma'u 
Nana Asma'u did her work of peace in Islam in the early 19th century, where now we find these uh, uh, distortions and violence against women. Now, I'd like to speak about recent female scholarship on education and peace in Islam. To address the earlier question of new approaches and methods that are required and needed to understand and evaluate women's agency in peace, building politically, socially, and everyday life, it is useful to look at some recent studies by Muslim American female scholars who emphasized Islamic education as a possible approach towards affecting positive and, and peaceful change in Muslim societies. Syrian-American scholar Ahmad Hafiz Barazanji has suggested one such model through her self-learning of Islam, SLI educational project that she proposed in her book, Women's Identity and the Quran, A New Reading. The central question in Barazanji's argument is reflected in a series of questions that she posed, including one of these is, why has the authority to interpret religious texts been uh, uh, exclusive to male uh, religious elites? She believed that nothing will change in, condi in the condition of Muslim women and Muslim society unless the authority to interpret the Quran is equal among men and women. Her strategy to achieve this objective is manifested in her proposal of the curriculum framework SLI as a means of self-realization and self-identity grounded in the Quran. Barazanji's stated purpose is not only to speak in a Muslim feminist voice, but also to create a new venue for exploring and engaging the sources of Islamic education and Islamic higher learning within the framework of the Quranic mandate and call to self-identity. Her work also attempts to stimulate discussion about uh, the Quran in the community as a whole and with her discussion of what she perceives as educational objectives within the framework of learners' needs and interests, Barzanji advocates an approach based on interest, such as a current event in the form of a problem or an issue that um, begged a solution or a discussion. Nehmat Hafiz Barzanji and her self-learning of Islam education project that she proposed in, in, in that book. And there is much detail for those interested to, in that book. This is a, a contrast to uh, the mere accumulation of facts, unsynthesized and unconsidered. Uh, she focuses on, um, I'm sorry about the typos of the idea, they do the focus on that, on engaging the mind and spirit of intellectual discourse as she believes that Muslim women who are trying to recapture their own agency in the textual interpretation process need to move one step further. Such agency, Barzanji believes, is linked to the notion of autonomous morality in Quranic terms within her pedagogical redefin redefinition of Islamic religiosity um, and morality, its potential impact on Muslim attitudes towards women's morality and education. Barzanji critically analyzes the works of three Muslim women scholars, Aisha Abdurrahman, Bint Shati, Amina Wadud, and Aziz al Hibri. And uh, this, you know, you can read this later so that we, to abbreviate some of. Uh, so we have already seen examples of women moving one step further, as was the case with Nana Asma'u in a 19th century African situation. While Barazanji's model of self-learning of Islam is largely theoretical, as it seems to be addressed to highly educated women engaged in the task of interpreting the Quran, moving from theory to practice is what will not only affect change in the society, but motivate women to play a role using their knowledge of the theological and social principles of peace in Islam to help members of their communities negotiate and practice peaceful coexistence. Clearly, the issue of Muslim American women's discussion or education becomes particularly important to this study within the context of the two African examples used. It is also significant given the current conflict between religion and culture in most of these Muslim societies, especially areas of conflict and war. This discrepancy is largely blamed on a misinterpretation, misinterpretation of Islam, and specifically the Quran. Amina Wadud, another Muslim American scholar, her discussion on the misinterpretation of the Quran is crucial to this study. She discusses three categories generally used to interpret women's rights in the Quran, traditional, reactive, and holistic. She argues that the traditional tafsir interpretation provides a construction of the entire Quran from classical to modern times with uh, specific objectives in mind, legal, historical, grammatical, rhetorical, or esoteric. However, 
while tafsir may be different based on each of these objectives, all objectives share an atomistic, uh, atomistic uh, methodology. This includes interpreting each verse of the Quran separately, beginning with the first, ending with the third. She rejects this traditional tafsir and um, argues that it is done specifically and mainly by men. Women were not involved, and it takes uh, verses out of context to the exclusion of their greater context. The second uh, uh, category is the reactive interpretation, and she explains that as you know, reactions to situations of op oppression about women in the Middle East or some Islamic countries, and base this interpretation based on those examples of oppression, which has nothing to do with Islam. Now, the third, the last category that she discusses is the most important for her, uh, is the holistic interpretation that reconsiders the whole method of chronic exegesis with respect to different social, economic, moral, and political concerns, including the issues of women. It is on this category of interpretation, which is relatively modern, that Amina Wadud grounds her book, Quran and Women Rereading the Sacred from a Woman's Perspective. So in the absence of an interpretation of the Quran that emphasizes gender equality or equity, one of the most shocking events that took place at the closing of the 20th century occurred when the former Taliban of Afghanistan came to power during the early 1990s. The first action widely documented that the radical extremist group did was to uh, close girls' schools and throughout the country and to deprive the entire population of women uh, of their illegitimate right to education. Although the Taliban example was extreme, it is by no means unique. The irony is that those who commit such acts claim that their decision to deprive women of education is based on Islam. Hence, the irony demonstrates importance of these women's scholarship and activism to correct such grave mis misconceptions. However, such claims are easily refuted by numerous examples um, in the Islamic tradition, both from the Quran and the Hadith itself. And the, the, the basic example, you know, when they claim that uh, Islam does not give women the right to education, you know, the verse is, Iqra, Iqra khalaq. Read in the name of your Lord, who taught the human being, taught the human being by the pen, taught them that they did not know. So how can they claim that uh, Islam does not give women the right to education when these were the very first verses revealed in the Quran? As you know, the Quran was not organized chronologically. So these were the first verses, but it comes in section 30, the Latin. And numerous other examples. Seek knowledge from the grave to the to the cradle to the grave, the prophetic tradition as well. Seek knowledge even if you have to go to China, probably the farthest area in that seventh century. The efforts of such women as Nana Asma'u and the early Sunnis women religious scholars discussed are deeply rooted in the Quranic tradition of supporting women's attainment of knowledge. The juxtaposition alluded to earlier also resides in the fact that the experiences and works of many of the women discussed in this chapter cannot be separated in a broader sense from how feminist criticism in Islam aims to deconstruct patriarchal interpretation of women's roles in Islam. Despite the historical gap between the works of such early women, religious scholars as Nana Asma'u and the early Sudanese examples on, one, on the one hand, and the works and scholarship of such recent Muslim feminist scholars as Naimad Barazanji and Amina Wadud, on the other hand, the parallel is unmistakable, given that they all emphasize the identity of women, pro, uh, of women, promote women's issues, education, and demand rights for women rooted in the religion rather than borrowed from other traditions. As Marco Badran has noted in her insightful article, Feminism and the Quran, in developing their feminist discourses, women have looked to the Quran as Islam's central and most sacred text calling attention to its fundamental message of social justice and human equality and to the rights therein granted to women. These important studies can open greater avenues, and I'm repeating what I said in, in the introduction, for women from around the world to direct their education towards emphasizing a culture of peace and to share their experiences on how to move from conflict and war to reconciliation and peace. 
They also instruct on how to further instill concepts, beliefs, and themes of social justice and solidarity, and to simultaneously acknowledge and value these peaceful means while reducing the negative impact of harmful, harmful cultural traditional practices on the society. Principles of democracy, tolerance, and openness are obvious requisites and prerequisites for a successful implementation of these endeavors. Thank you very much indeed.